That's okay. Uh, our next talk, Benjamin Erickson, with a slightly different title, Randomized Sparse PCA. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm going to talk about Randomized Sparse PCA. Uh, this is joint work with my collaborators, Pong and Sasha, both from the University of uh, Washington. Um, PCA is probably the most uh, important and most widely used dimensionality reduction technique in data science. This is mainly because it's very simple. So the aim is to find a new set of uh, variables um, or uncorrelated variables which account for most um, of the uh, variability in the data. Um, and we do this by forming um, a weighted linear combination of uh, the original uh, variables. Um, so in machine learning, we use often PCA as a black box uh, um, tool, and um, that's fine to do uh, to extract some features, um, maybe which is then subsequently used for classification tasks. Um, but in some other domains, we want to use uh, PCA to summarize the data, to um, um, to visualize the data, and uh, to learn something about the coherent structure. Um, which uh, might be underlying um, of a system. And um, that might be difficult, or interpretation of the principal components might be difficult if we have um, um, quite a lot of variables, because, um, well, what, what, how do you interpret the new principal <coughs> components, which are a weighted linear combination of all the original variables? So it might be better to, to come up with a more parsimonious model, a simpler model, um, which is easier to uh, interpret. And sparsity is a great uh, tool to, um, um, to improve the interpretability, to um, come up with a simpler model. Um, often it is used to um, come up with a better bias variance trade-off. And as an example here, um, some climate data where we extract on the top row the um, PCA modes which um, are kind of global modes, whereas if we extract sparse PCA modes, we, we see that the modes are kind of more localized, and uh, this might be easier to interpret. OK. Um, uh, there is a, a, well, PC, uh, sparse PCA is a widely studied problem, and I do not try to attempt to, to summarize the whole literature. But uh, I will start my discussion here with the formulation by Sue Hasty and Tip Chirani, who formulate sparse PCA as a regularized regression type uh, problem. Um, so we, we want to find um, um, a weight matrix B, a, a, a sparse weight matrix B, um, which a few active coefficients. Uh, so that we form the, uh, the new principal components as a um, linear weighted combination of only of some of the original variables. So this should be then uh, easier to, to give a meaningful interpretation to the principal components. Um, and how do we do this? Uh, we do this by augmenting um, our objective uh, with some penalty uh, which um, promotes some sparsity on B. Okay, um, the, the setup I hope is so far clear. Um, probably have seen this before. Excuse me, I haven't. So mm -hmm. that sort of is, a, is a, a projection on the columns, because that's x times i minus b a transpose. It's sort of a projection on the columns, right? But not quite. Yes, so it's not. So b is not orthogonal yeah. anymore. So in the original pl uh, problem formulation, b would be a. And a has also normal uh, columns, and it would be projection. But now, since b is sparse, we de uh, destroy the orthogonality here. So it's, a, it's an approximation. That's a trade-off between sparsity and orthogonality here. And you get the sparsity through that R of B. Uh, through the R of B, where R is a sparsity promoting regularizer, and uh, widely used um, regularizers are um, the L1 norm, uh, lasso, or a combination of L1, L2, um, which is elastic net. Um, or as I will show later, we can use also L0. OK. Um, <clears throat> So this is a highly non-convex problem, um, um, but we can use an alternating uh, algorithm uh, to find a stationary point. And um, the algorithm proceeds uh, 
are follow. So we fix B and update A. So this involves, oops, uh, this involves an orthogonal progressive problem, which has closed form solution. So basically, we just need to compute an SVD. And then in the second uh, step, we fix A and update B by solving K, um, uh, K regularized regression problems um, using a coordinate descent algorithm or um, LARS. Um, OK. Um, so this algorithm is not necessarily very scalable, uh, as I show here. So for a relatively small problem, I would say, we try to extract the dominant 10 sparse um, um, principal components or compute these sparse uh, weight vectors. And we see kind of uh, <coughs> using coordinate descent and sparse, we require some, quite, quite some computational um, uh, time uh, to converge. So this motivated us to come up with a new algorithm um, embedding sparse PCA into the variable projection framework first, and then in addition use some randomized methods to further accelerate uh, the algorithm. OK. Um, I will continue by first describing um, sparse PCA via, the, uh, via variable projection, and then talk more about randomized methods. Um, just as a quick recap, so very projection is an algorithm from the 70s, which was um, mainly used to solve nonlinear least square problems, uh, and has been more recently used also for other problems like uh, PDE constraint optimization, um, exponential fitting. Um, and the idea is that we have an objective of the following form here, and um, we rewrite um, this problem as a value function optimization problem. And this is interesting if we have an efficient routine to compute A. Um, and as I've seen before on the previous slide, uh, we can efficiently compute A because this has a, a closed form solution here. So let's use this idea and um, recast um, sparse PCA um, as a, um, a sparse PCA value function here. Um, and then project out A and we come up uh, with a new um, uh, problem formulation here. Okay, so why is this a good idea again? Well, we exploit here the efficiency of updating A. So I claim computing an SVD is cheap. Um, and then this algorithm rebalances the work between um, the A and B updates. Um, um, so, well, further it allows us to use any proximal algorithm. And I will not uh, go into the details about that here, but we can also consider robust loss function to do robust sparse PCA. And you will find details about that in the corresponding paper. So, I'm sorry, you're minimizing over orthogonal functions in the fair, or orthogonal matrices yeah, in the, the fair. Yeah, the problem. Procrustus problem. problem. Okay. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, I will show you the update rules. OK, so now well, we can, for example, update A using a prox gradient step here. So the gradient um, of the value function is um, uh, simple to compute. Um, and then once we have updated uh, B, we solve just the progressive problem in step B. So um, that's the new uh, algorithm we propose. And um, well, if you for some more theory about this, I refer to the uh, paper. I don't want to dwell too much on that. Um, still, we have the challenge. Um, if we have to deal with relatively big data, and relative, I mean here, um, compared to the computational environment I have, because I want to do my computation mainly on my laptop. Um, so um, uh, 20 or 30 gigabyte uh, data set might be already big there <coughs> to do the computations. OK. Um, to quote John von Neumann, um, truth is much too complicated to allow anything but approximations. So the question is, how can we get a good approximation to the right problem? And uh, well, we have heard a lot about that. Uh, we can uh, use uh, ideas from randomized numerical linear algebra to turn a big data into a small data, um, sketch to solve, as we have heard yesterday, and then use the smaller matrix uh, to learn our sparse um, um, uh, 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 sparse uh, weight matrix. OK. Um, this is a sketch a sparse PCA um, problem. So um, we, we sketch um, our input matrix X using this uh, sampling rescaling matrix. So 
um, selecting some rows or some, uh, so yes, a few, a few interesting rows from X or um, maybe we form some um, linear combination of some of the rows um, to get uh, X tilde. So this is a much uh, smaller problem which we hopefully can efficiently uh, solve. Excuse me, could I ask another question? Mm -hmm. So in the original SVD, I have an orthogonal matrix, the singular values, and another orthogonal matrix. Yes. So here, um, I have just BA transpose? Yes. So this is uh, BA transpose. So, so the singular values are just sort the of... The singular values, um, well, I mean, I, I'm not... Uh, uh, <laughs> Well, I'm not solving the SVD here, right? I don't need the but singular value. But you want the sparse SVD, right? Yes. That's, so Spar sparse PCA. Okay, because you have a centered matrix. Okay. Yes. So the, 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 the singular values, if you, if I would write, uh, um, if I would write Z, um, so or my my uh, principal component, so this would be U scaled by the singular values, right? Um, so this would be another formulation so here. But that's the same like X times. Uh, okay. Um, so and you want something interpretable, right? So is yes. your interpre interpretable output then x tilde times b? No, my well, my so I want to have b the modes to be sparse, so that I if I interpret it that um, if I form z, if you remember, we said um, my principal components, the new variables, um, is a linear combination of x times uh, b. I see. Right. So b is now sparse. So if I take the first vector. Um, of it, I form a, 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 well, a sparse um, um, weighted linear combination of the original so variables. Is really what you want. So XB, X, so Z is not sparse. The principal components, there's no. Uh, I mean, there are other formulations, I think, where, where they try to make um, the principal components sparse. Thank you. Thank you. But okay, good. No, not a problem. Um, okay, so this would be, um, I think, um, well, probably not too much uh, to tell about that, but. Um, well, just a uh, quick recap. I mean, there are um, qu um, large uh, or quite uh, many options um, how we can sketch. We can use uh, sampling or random projection. I mean, we have heard a lot about this, so um, not talking too much about it. So let's see um, how the performance is here for a little toy problem where now the data are generated from an underlying uh, sparse model. Uh, we have 10,000 observations. Um, and really, uh, the, the sketching option, whether I use uniform, Gaussian, or count sketch, does not matter too much. Interestingly, here, count sketch uh, performs uh, slightly better even than uh, the deterministic approach. Um, but that is a toy problem. Um, so let's look to some real data um, that are kind of image data. Um, and here I try to compute the uh, um, t uh, K f or kind of the uh, top 15 um, sparse rates uh, vectors. And um, here we see that kind of all these um, sketched approaches um, converge to another, probably to another stationary point. Um, obviously I could increase maybe the, the amount of sketching here, but then the computational cost increase. Um, whether it's the randomized SPC, uh, sparse PCA formulation, well, which I talk um, on the next slides about, um, um, provides a near optimal um, um, approximation. Okay, um, so what do we do? Um, well, we follow here the work by Heiko, Martison, and Trope, and replace S by, by Q, where Q is um, a uh, basis function um, which uh, has orthogonal uh, columns and tries to approximate the column space of our input matrix uh, X. And well, Gunnar has uh, told us about yesterday, so you're probably all uh, familiar with it. Um, and the um, optimization problem looks pretty much the same like us before. Again, it is a, a much smaller problem uh, to be solved. Um, still, I uh, quickly um, um, repeat what we do here. So first, um, we try to form um, um, randomly weighted linear combination of the columns to form a sketch. And once we have this uh, sketch, we just compute the QR to get the orthonormal basis. And um, as we have heard yesterday, also we normally we try to do some oversampling, so we choose L a little bit larger than uh, the desired target rank. Uh, K. Okay. 
Um, in practice, I do not want to sample directly from X, but I compute um, a couple of additional power iteration to drive the um, spectrum down. So I sample from a pre-processed matrix, and we all know we can efficiently compute this um, uh, using subspace iterations. And then at the end, well, I just uh, use this queue to project my uh, input matrix to low dimensional space. OK. Um, how can we scale this approach? Um, can I uh, follow here loosely the work by um, Gunnar and Sergey? So uh, we could um, block our matrix X and then compute a QB decomposition on uh, every of those blocks. We can do this sequentially or in a distributed fashion. And then at the end, well, I have um, my, my Bs here, which I can collect um, and stack them together in a matrix K. And then I compute another uh, QB decomposition of that. And I get us an output, this X here, which I then uh, have as input to my uh, sparse PCA solver. Um, well, Gunnar told us yesterday about the UTV, so there might be actually a better approach, meanwhile, uh, to do this. But anyway, this works uh, quite nicely on, on my notebook. Um, just to show here um, the advantage of using this um, blocked scheme, uh, we have the randomized sparse PCA, which um, has a much higher um, uh, peak memory requirement, about 6 uh, gigabyte, compared if I use this blocked scheme, I uh, can, I need only uh, somewhat below 4 gigabyte memory um, over the whole runtime. So I really can scale my problem uh, depending on my computational environment I'm using. Okay, um, the only thing I need to be able to access uh, efficiently some of the rows in the data matrix, but if I have the data in a um, hierarchical um, data file format, then this is not a problem. Um, okay, let's show me um, last couple of minutes to, to, to show uh, an example you have seen at the beginning already. So um, we use here kind of the sea surface temperature data or high resolution version of this where we have um, the daily temperature measurements um, at about 700,000 spatial grid points. And we have those measurements available for the last 37 years. So in total, um, we have um, a data set which is about 36 gigabyte big. Uh, that is maybe not big, um, but it's too big to fit into my fast memory on my notebook. And a lot of these sparse PCA users uh, want to do kind of their computations, um, well, on, on their notebook. Um, <coughs> they don't know how to do distributed computing or some other uh, uh, fancy scalable stuff. Um, <coughs> OK, so here are the extracted uh, sparse PCA modes. Uh, the top row shows um, if, uh, the results if you use the elastic net. So again, this is the L1 uh, regularization plus a little bit of rich. Um, and uh, on the bottom, we see the zero net. So that is L0 plus L2, uh, which leads to a slightly sparser solution. Um, but I think, um, OK, this one is dead. Um, it uh, seems to be that the structure is, uh, pops out to be a bit more uh, crisp. And this mode here is known as the ENSO mode, uh, which describes um, uh, the, the famous uh, weather event uh, called El Nino and La Nina. And um, if we just use this mode now to um, form the uh, corresponding principal component, uh, we get something which looks like uh, this here. So this is kind of actually a 12 months moving average over the principal components. And we see kind of those uh, sharp peaks here, which correspond to the El Nino a couple years ago. This was uh, the big El Nino in the late 90s. And this was um, a strong El Nino event uh, in the early 80s. Um, so. Uh, well, this can be used to, to understand uh, climate better. Um, and similar, it can be used in many other applications. Uh, well, supposedly, it can be used in many other uh, applications um, to, to get a kind of more interpretable um, results. Um, 
quick other example, this would be a flow behind a cylinder. Again, we see on the left-hand side the PCA modes, on the right-hand side uh, sparse PCA modes, which uh, kind of uh, nicely contextualize the coherent uh, structure of this data set. Okay. Um, let me sum up my talk. So PCA is uh, certainly a widely used tool for data analysis, but in many applications uh, we are interested also in a better interpretation um, in summarizing the data, and in this case sparse PCA might be a valuable tool. Um, and if we are willing to sacrifice some amount of accuracy, uh, then we can use randomized methods in order to explore large data sets. Um, you will find software on my GitHub repository in R, that's the sparse PCA package, and in Python within the Restretto package, and the corresponding paper is on archive. There it is. Time for a few questions. The, um, um, have you, have you looked at the, how the performance of this behaves as the iteration progresses? Um, how, how Perform we, the yeah. performance of what? The sparse PCA method you're yes. proposing, here, which is iterative. Yes. Um, so how, how does the um, how does the um, um, result improve as you iterate on the uh, the alternative projection of the value? Com compared, or with the with the randomized approach, no, or with yes. the Maybe I'll talk to you later. No, no, sorry, sorry. So there's an iter you're proposing an iterative approach. Yes, right? yes, and yes. So how does the quality of the result improve along the path of the iteration? How many iterations do you need? Does it help a lot? Oh, I, I you know, I see. I, well, okay. That's uh, um, so in practice. Well, normally you you constrain it by your computational budget you have. So um, those results I've seen uh, shown here last, it's normally what you get after 100, um, 100 to 150 iteration. So it, 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 should, it should flatten out in, in many cases, depending on, on the amount of um, uh, sparsity you want to introduce uh, converges relatively uh, uh, quickly. But, um, uh, well, you can, you can define a stopping criterion however you want to define it, right? Um, that depends on, on, on the... Uh, well, on the task, um, but I think in practice quite often you, you have a fixed number of iteration and um, it, I mean I looked obviously to different um, uh, stopping points and you don't see such a big difference, at least not by... by I'm just curious, I have a little bit of numerical experience with this and um, I, I found it a little depressing because it seemed like all the methods that I applied got the same amount of variance, um, no matter how fancy or simple they were. Yeah. And so that's part of the reason I was wondering whether it really helps to like... Um, to, to, to go to much. Away on this if you want to um, I think in, in most cases, uh, not except you have really toy exempt where you know the ground truth and really want to nail uh, <coughs> the sparse underlying coefficients. But um, in a lot of uh, practical applications, I think uh, you don't gain too much uh, if you go another 100 iterations. How did the running times of the sketching based methods compare to uh, your method? Oh, okay. So, yeah, I have not shown this. I was uh, not sure what to show if I show uh, objective versus time or versus iteration. Um, so I, I choose kind of here the sketching amount so that um, that I achieved the same running times or that even the randomized method was a little bit better um, uh, of the randomized method. Because the randomized method, I can go uh, uh, very small. If I have a target rank of 15, right, the, the sketch size is... Uh, uh, 25, basically, what I did if I have uh, 20 samples for oversampling. So it's uh, X is uh, uh, yeah, very, very thin and long, whereas sketching I need normally a little bit more. Uh, but obviously sketching is faster. Um, so I try to balance this here. But I have other plots. If you're interested, I can show you, I can show you the plots where I plot uh, objectives versus running time of the algorithm. Uh, how do you solve the optimization with the L0 regularization? Oh, this com comes up. I mean, the, the prox, uh, prox uh, or proximal methods are allow me to do this. So, kind of, uh, this is widely studied. So, they kind of uh, provide you a relatively flexible framework that you can just plug in whatever um, prox you want, and then have a soft threshold or hard threshold. So, L zero here, to to be specific, is just a hard threshold. Um, and then, if you have L zero plus L two, this is a scaled uh, hard threshold. 
So this is uh, widely studied. There's actually nothing fancy about it too much, except the theory, maybe. But yeah. Michael, um, you know, I think it's your last figure about the sea surface. Of oh, what? Yeah, is it the next next one? What can you explain about what this is really telling us? Oh, okay. So, so first of all, so I, I used I computed. So what I showed here is uh, the the sparse weight vector just visualized. So this is kind of a column of B, right? And then I, I use this, uh, this weight vector, so I mean, I uh, flatten it um, to um, form a linear combination um, of all the original variables, which are kind of my measurements, uh, my daily measurements, right? And then I get a principal component, um, which uh, basically tells me something about the, but well, I can think about this as a temporal mode, which uh, tells me how, how this uh, mode uh, varies over time. Um, and that's what I have plotted. Uh, basically, here the only thing to make the plot a little bit nicer, I have taken um, a 12 months moving average um, over the principal uh, components or over the temporal modes. Um, what, what so is this, is, this is time, yeah. or kind of this is kind of the modes. And um, on the side, you just see kind of uh, yeah the uh, the coefficients. Temperature. Yeah, it's not. It's not. It's not really. Well, I mean, I, I could not. Uh, well, the deviation, uh, in, the deviation. I could say, yeah. I mean, a bit careful because I mean, obviously, I'm not in the original uh, right. space where I have temperature anymore. But yeah. Well, what does I? Ian, what's the y-axis? Oh, the y-axis. So this, yeah, what we just said. So it's kind of uh, the, the the deviation. Like, um, if this. Uh, this event here is uh, has a well is is uh, is large, so it's popping up, um, or if it's um, not basically at the time, not not um, um, yeah has um, it's uh, increasing it's relatively increasing small. Temperature. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. So it it it's in a certain sense, it's the increasing decreasing temperature. It's just I would not say this uh, exactly is on a temperature scale anymore, right? Because um, I'm in a rotated space. But in a certain sense, yeah. So is it, oh, maybe, yeah, I should say this. So uh, should say so, yeah. So I know if, if I have a peak here, then uh, the temperature, sea surface temperature, is extremely warm in this region, which corresponds to the El Nino um, event. And uh, at some points, it is much uh, cooler. And this uh, corresponds to a El Nino uh, event. All right. Okay. Thank you again. Yeah.